The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. We are back in the House of Mystery. I'm your host, Gal Warren, and I'm broadcasting from KCAA Los Angeles. And I'm Kevin Thompson, and I'm coming to you from WXEI, the talk of Clearview, Florida. And joining us also is Stephen David Lantley, who is our true crime commentator, if I could say it. Uh, thanks for being here, Steve. Hello. I am glad to be here. So now, uh, we've had uh, many shows on and, and uh, covered uh, all sorts of crime, and, and we had Dan Abrams already, and uh, he is hosting or co-hosting with the great Nancy Grace. Thanks for being here, Nancy. <laughs> Good morning, guys, Al, Kevin, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Well, well, Nancy, first I want to say that it's a pleasure. And, and one thing is um, I, I was thinking about you uh, when we were planning the interview, and one thing that came to mind um, was now I, I, I'm close. I'm in your age. I'm 56. And when I was a kid, a lot of the... Okay, right there, right there. X, X nay. My children think I'm 11 and a half. Don't blow it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, my mistake. Of course, I'm the old guy, 56. Now, when I was a kid, when we watched uh, television shows, um, a lot of the people that were in uh, prosecutorial areas and stuff were considered the bad guy. Um, like, I mean, Perry Mason was, was a good guy. People loved him. He was a defense attorney, and, and even right up to Matlock, all of that sort of thing. But you somehow have managed to turn that around. You're a TV prosecutor that seems to be fighting for the, the little guy. And I think that's why people uh, love you so much. It's because they feel like you're there for them. You're in their corner, just like Perry Mason. But you were a prosecutor. So I, I did how did that happen? How does that go to where you changed? Well, I can tell you this much. It was totally unplanned. Okay. Let's we'll start with that. When I was in college at that time at Mercer University, I was studying to be Shakespearean literature professor. That's all I cared about. I loved it. But during that time, shortly before my wedding, my fiance was murdered. And that changed. It, my world exploded. Keith's world ended. Mine exploded. I dropped out of school. I lost down to 89 pounds. I couldn't stand the sight or the smell of food. Uh, we couldn't. I was at home with my mom and dad at that point, and I couldn't stand to hear the TV, I, I, the radio in the car, and my mother even cut the cl turned off the clock because I couldn't stand to hear the ticking. I just. It was just so much because, honestly, we were fairly poor. I grew up on a red dirt road in Macon, Georgia, outside the city, actually. And, but I didn't know that. I was perfectly happy. And all the kids, the children in school with me, we were all in the same boat. It was public school in a rural farming area. I never knew anything about crime or violence, nothing. And... Um, my parents worked like crazy. My dad was a railroad man. My mom worked at a factory as a financial officer. And, you know, that was a, a wonderful life. And that was back when I could get on my bicycle and ride after school until mm -hmm. I heard the chimes in the church steeple at 6 o'clock. It was time to go home for supper. So I grew up like that. And then Keith's murder not only devastated me in a personal way, but... My whole world of view, because Keith didn't know this guy. It was, I won't say random, but it was, in my mind, random. This guy that murdered him had worked at the same construction. He, Keith had a summer job. He's about to graduate in geology and already had a, line, a job lined up in, with an oil rig out in Colorado. I, I, I can't remember the details of that. But he was working over the summer on a construction crew. His dad was best friends with some guy that had a construction business. And he went on the job, and the guy that had been fired a week or two before Keith started was angry and was stand Keith left to go get soft drinks that day for everybody at lunchtime. It's out in the middle of nowhere. 
And when he was pulling back in, the guy saw the company truck and went berserk and started shooting. Oh, no. And Keith was the victim. And I'll never forget it. I was uh, taking the last of a series of exams getting ready, planning graduation, and uh, coming out of a statistics, statistics exam. And I can remember the world was so bright and shiny when I came out, the sun was shining. And I stopped midway across campus to call my job. I worked in the library at Mercer University to tell them I was going as fast as I could. I was coming that way, and I'd be there in 10 minutes. And they told me to call Keith's family. And I knew then, you know, I knew right then. And I, that's when I dropped out of school. And I ultimately did go back, though, with a plan to put Shakespeare behind me and go to law school to try to help other crime victims. The only way I knew, and it's funny the way you mentioned Matlock, who I love. He always makes me want to have a hot dog. <laughs> and um, I, I, when I get the children in the car, I force them to watch Andy and Mayberry. Yeah. Um, and I love Perry Mason. And what really led me to this, though, was my sister is four years older than me, three and a half. And I would, the moment she put down the book, I'd grab it. And she was assigned to kill a mockingbird. And I read that, I guess, when I was in the fourth or fifth grade. And it had a profound impact on me. And... I wanted to be like Atticus Finch. And, yes, I know he was a defense attorney, but he was doing the right thing. And it made such an effect on me. That's the only thing coming from, a, as I said, a red dirt road. I didn't know what else to do except I would go and fight crime. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And that's how I still see myself. And that's how I, I, I feel. Every time I waver or I'm tired I think of Keith's big blue eyes looking at me now I have the children my twins and I want to do the right thing I know that was a long answer I'm sorry I hate people to go on and on no. I'm like speak to me in a sound bite for Pete's sake I can't take it like when I get an email if it's a paragraph I'm like what is wrong with this person <laughs> no actually we, we, we like to have a good dialogue with people it's not <laughs> Yes. Not just the typical. Because I, I was, we had Marsha Clark, and, and I know that she said that she seemed to be rather hard on the justice system as it treats females. Um, do you feel that it's a bigger uphill battle uh, being a female in, in, in prosecution? Than... <laughs> Look, I know it's going to be hard for you guys to take in because you're very open minded and I assume progressive. Like my dad. He was happy my mom was working. He was never an issue. I saw, I grew up seeing them as equals. I mean, she went from being a bank teller to, to being the CFO of a company, for Pete's sake, on a high school education because they couldn't afford college. And I, I, I just, still, she was, is a role model for me. You know, she grew up on a, a farm, and someone heard her play the piano at school one day, and she had an anonymous donor who supported her private piano lessons all the way till past high school. She actually studied at the Wesleyan University Conservatory. And it's amazing what she became, and that was my role model. I mean, she could do anything. She could paint the wall. She could hang wallpaper. She could be a CFO. She could landscape the yard and cut the grass. It works. She did it all. And that's how I grew up thinking, hey, if you can imagine it, you can do it. She did it. But I would hear her occasionally talk about things that were happening at work. I didn't understand that. When I got into law school, I looked around. There were no women there. I did, didn't pay any attention. All I wanted to do was get out and start trying cases. I got in the courtroom. I had judges hit on me. Judges be mean to me. Blah, blah, blah. I remember one judge tried to kiss me on the mouth and ended up kissing me on the knee. He was that blind. I was sitting beside him. And I There's just a lot like, of distance between okay. them. Okay. And luckily, I have a witness that saw me. But I wasn't alone. He tried to kiss a court reporter and managed to kiss her on the ear and impale her earring on his lip. So, you know, yes, I had a judge, I, uh, quote, walk me to my car and lay one on me right there at the car. I mean, it just... What did I do? I avoided it. 
and kept trying my case because my case, my victim, my mission was more important to me than what was happening to me, if that makes any sense. And, hey, don't leave out the TV business. Look around. Yeah. How many 50-year-old women do you see on the screen? Think about it. Yeah. Touche. Yep. Now, uh, you're going to be in, I'm just going to bring this up. You're going to be in PrimeCon again. This is the second year, and you're... Oh, you're, tell it, honey. <laughs> I'm just planning it right now. <laughs> well, well, the reason is, you know, Stephen, our, who's our uh, commentary person, is uh, the opening speaker for you at uh, CrimeCon. Oh, good. I need some info on him so I can really give it to him. He's on the line. <laughs> he's on the line, and he's... Uh, he actually is a pretty amazing person. We're real lucky to have I've him. I've heard. And he, he, I tell you, if you want to know forensics and details, but he does it so well. So, so Stephen, he, he, he really was excited that you were on the show. And he wanted to you know the thing I like about Stephen is he has all this knowledge, forensic knowledge, and this is a common mistake that prosecutors make. Well, well lawyers in general, they think they know so darn much. Do you ever get stuck on an elevator with a lawyer? Just, oh, it's insufferable. Throws around Latin terms and oh, blah, blah, blah. It's so irritating. Of course, as a prosecutor, I love it because it turns the jury off so much. But the thing about him is he can take all that information and relay it in a way that everybody can understand. It's giving me a flashback when I would try uh, murder cases. I, I would look at the autopsy part. I'm like, what? I'm an MD. I'm a JD, not an MD, for Pete's sake. I have to get in my beat-up car, drive over to the ME, the more, and go through literally every line. I'm sure it drove them insane. Every line, and I'd write notes in the column, which we, in law school called it book briefing. So when I told the jury about it, I could use regular people talk, and I would know what I was talking about. So that's the thing about forensics. You've got to be able to relay it in a way the jury can get, for Pete's sake. <laughs> well, Steve, your thoughts? <laughs> well, that, that, that's true. But let me tell you something. Let me, let me change the subject a little bit. You hey haven't there. had, you haven't had, Al and Kevin, y'all have not had chicken pot pie until you've had the recipe by Nancy, okay? Uh, let me tell you that Thank right you. up front. I was just <laughs> feeling bad. Absolutely. I was just feeling bad because I have not made chicken pot pie or I've expanded it to beef pot pie and ham pot pie and turkey. I want to do turkey pot pie with leftovers. I, I cook about five nights a week. Tonight, I'm wow. pot potting Mexican chicken. <laughs> wow, that sounds great. Well, pot, uh -huh. well Pot's not legal in Alabama yet, so I won't fry it yet. So. <laughs> Let me tell you, okay, you take the chicken, I prefer boneless thighs because they're juicy. You put them in the bottom of the crock pot, a can of black beans, a uh, kernel of corn drained, and then get this, peach mango salsa. I usually go to Kro uh, Kroger because it's cheaper or, public, or uh, Piggly Wiggly, but... The Publix peach mango salsa, you pour that on top, you cook it all day, right before you serve it, 20 minutes, put in a block of low-calorie cream cheese, stir it all up over yellow rice. I mean, I can't even talk about it so good. My children eat the whole bulk, the whole thing. Try it. Wow. I can't imagine yeah. Anson Grace and Kroger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I would do if I was on the aisles and all of a sudden there's Nancy Grace picking up some mango. I'd be like, what? No. Well, with all, without all that makeup and hair and false eyelashes, unless I start speaking, nobody knows. Yeah. I just mind my own business. Yeah. Actually, we have Ann Bremner. She's a real regular on... Uh, I love on, her. Yeah, she's in Seattle. We're, we're, we're have, normal. Have you ever talked to her about her cat? No. Jimmy? Oh, my oh. stars. Her beloved cat, who recently passed away, God rest his soul, um, she lives in a high-rise, and the cat was smarter than most people I know. The cat would wait at the elevator. She'd let the cat out in the morning. The cat would go away at the elevator. He'd wait for the elevator to open and jump on. And then when it would get to the lobby, he could recognize the lobby and go outside. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. You know, it's amazing. Actually, I'm going to do some work with her coming up in May. She's one of her cases I'm going to write with her. 
I love Anne. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, so Nancy, going going to your show, Grace versus Abrams. Um, oh my goodness, I forgot all about that. I was yes. thinking about Anne Brenner's red lipstick. One time, we, she has a special kind. I think it's expensive. It could be Chanel, uh, or it's, to irritate her, I like to say Channel. But uh, she lost. I don't know if she remembers this. We were somewhere, and she lost her tube of red lipstick, and we tore the whole restaurant up. Trying, we found it, by the way, and she heard through the grapevine it was going out of. They weren't making any more. She ran around town and bought up every tube of this special red lipstick. Wow. Yes, she did. That's you can so cross examine her about that one day. She's going to wonder where you found all this out. Oh, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, Grace V. Abrams. Yes, Dan and I did not get along. That's no secret. We come from two wor different worldviews. And it's not Republican, Democrat, because I voted both ways my whole life, depending on who was running. And th th that means nothing to me. I, I, I couldn't care less about politics, except I want the economy not to tank. I want people treated fairly in our country. And I don't want a nuclear war. That's pretty much what I look at. Uh, but it's more about the world view as it relates to the justice system. What's right? What's wrong? And a big thing that he hits a snag on, um, and I get it. I don't agree with it, but I understand I'm more about the truth. What really happened? What is the truth? And he's more about what can we prove in court? Like, uh, it, it doesn't matter if it, the truth, the verdict reflects what really happened, the honest truth. It's more about was it um, an, a, a fair fight in court? To me, that's secondary. I want the truth. Yes, of course, I want it to be fair. I don't want to put the wrong person in jail for Pete's sake. But I want the truth. I want a true verdict. And we, we just see things very differently. Well, quite honestly, Nancy, are they really that different points of view? Uh, actually, they're very different. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see, buddy. And uh, what, another thing I like about it is there's a live studio audience. And I always wonder sometimes when juries come out with these zany theories, I'm like, what were they thinking? Well, now I know because we, we go at it and then we go out to the audience. I love going out to the audience and hear their theories. I mean, you'd be surprised at what one of the uh, Chandra Levy jurors told me. When you're you're going to fall off your chair. And uh, then a top mom juror. I mean, I can't even tell you what these juries were really talking about back there. And I learned all these, it, they, they're not rehearsed. The studio audience is not rehearsed. They come up with their own questions, their own theories about what happened, their own points about the evidence, some things I had not even thought of that they come up with. I love it. Well, it's like Phil Donahue. Go out mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I try to beat Dan out to the studio audience. Yeah. I grab the microphone and run behind his back and get out there before he can. <laughs> but, but why why don't we have a justice system like that? You, you bring up a good point. You know, why not ask the jury their thoughts? Why why don't well, we know, do that? I just have the judge, Judge Daniels, and he. I mean, this is within the law. The jury can ask questions, but most judges frown upon it and do not allow it. This Judge Daniels would always let the jury just ask the witnesses questions. And a lot of times you specifically do not ask a question because you don't like the answer or the answer is going to open up a can of worms. For instance, um, it could open up um, the defendant's rap sheet and that would be a mistrial. I mean, there's a lot of times you specifically don't ask certain questions because you know the answer is, not you can't, the answer can't come in evidence, but th this judge would allow the jury to ask questions. I would sit there frozen in my seat, just waiting for something to cause a mistrial when the jury would start asking questions. But luckily, it worked out. So let me ask you this, and this is something that we here at the House of Mystery have debated each other very much on. And whenever there's a big case in in the news. You know that that hits national attention. There's several people that I like to run to first to get their opinions on, and you're actually one of them. 
And my wife Thank was like, you. well, what's, what's Nancy, you know, what's Nancy going to say about it? You know, not, not kissing your butt. It's just the truth. Hello, excuse me. We do not say B-U-T-T. We say booty or rear end. Okay. Well, I'm not okay. Kissing we also booty. don't say O-M-G. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what would Nancy do? It would, yes. Okay, hit me. <laughs> W-W-N-D is my new, my new bracelet now. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm flattered. Okay, hit me. Go ahead. What case do you want to hear about? I well, hope I know about it. Not necessarily a, a case. It's it's the fact that you are on television and you're very you know well spoken about cases. But do you think that the media attention actually can already try a person before they even get to the courtroom? I have one question. Uh, two syllables for you, my dear. O J. Yeah. Do I need to say anything else? <laughs> Top Mom, Robert Blake, they're not listening to us. I wish they were, but they're not. They are so not listening. The juries are not listening to Talking Heads. I mean, half the Talking Heads haven't even tried a case. They don't know what they're talking about. And plus, they are on the inside. Most of the pundits are on the outside. They're not watching the testimony and the rulings every day. You've got to stay up on it to, to really know what you're talking about. So is, is there something we can do? Should we should we cut the televised trials or cut them? No, I think there should be more on them. Let me direct you to our constitution. If you look into the we call it now legislative minutes, but at that time there I don't know that it was called that. There was much discussion about courtrooms, and it was discussed that courtrooms should be big enough for the whole community to fit into, which, of course, is impossible because the best detergent is sunshine, no secret proceedings. In our world, that means cameras in the courtroom, reporters in the courtroom. I want to know. I want to know what the rulings are in cases. I want to know what judges are doing. They're not above the law, although they think they are. And I, I, I want to know. I have a right to know. I'm an American. I pay taxes. I want to know what's going on in the courthouse, every courthouse. Bam. And bombshell tonight. But what, <laughs> bombshell tonight. Well, the, the, but how about cases where the, because, you know, you know, come on, you must get it too. Um, and we get terrible um, things. People say terrible things on, on the Internet and social media. Oh, you haven't been reading Google again, have you? <laughs> well, I Just try. use that for recipes and fast yeah. facts. Don't, well, don't, don't torture yourself. Well, you know, but I, I'm just saying, you know, because when we talk to, uh, God, Kirk Nurmi and all these different, and their lives have been ruined because ruined. it was televised. Uh, their lives are not ruined because it's televised. His life was ruined because he had a client named Jody Arias <laughs> that hated his guts. Yeah. And he defended her, and he defended her because he was a public defender. Okay, that was his chosen profession. When you are a public defender, who do you think you're going to defend? Criminals, murderers, rapists, child molesters, dope dealers, those are your clients. Okay, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, haven't you heard you lay down with a, talk, a dog, you wake up with a tick, a flea? Yes, he sadly got tangled up with Jody Arias. It wasn't Cameron's fault. It was her fault because she's evil. And then it's the judge's fault that would not let him off the case when he begged to get off the case. I swear I think that case gave him cancer for Pete's sake. I do, too. I really do. I mean, he... I, malignant. I, I, isn't the Latin root of malignant mal, M-A-L, for worry? Bad? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, that's what I think, too. I, it, uh, I think it uh, almost killed him. Yeah. I know. I, I mean, being in the room with Jody Aries every day would kill me, too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she, she's just... It's like a death uh, eater. Yeah. Wait, no, not a death eater, a dementor that just sucks your soul out of your body. Yeah. Wait, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we've gotten far afield, haven't we? Well, that's, that's what we like to do here. We love having dialogue. And you know, people would be better if we just talk in dialogue like this. It's better than doing <laughs> the same old. <laughs> oh, that, that, that leads me to another point. Since you didn't ask, have you ever seen lawyers or TV people, they have their little list of questions, and no matter what the person says, they keep asking the questions. Yeah. <laughs> it can be totally, totally 
yeah. non-responsive to what the person just said. Yeah, <laughs> <reading questions. laughs> That's crazy to, see, to put it up there, and then they're the ones that become politicians, because then they just stand there and talk. <laughs> the same it doesn't matter what you say. You know, it's what, I know. I, love, I used to love it when lawyers would do that. I love the body language, too, whenever you ask the scripted question and they go offline and you're like, oh, God, you can just see, you can see the pucker, you know? But we are uh, kicking it off with Top Mom, of course. It had to be. And uh, I, another, a thing about Top Mom that really amazes, I guess it doesn't amaze me, I guess I should have seen it coming, like an earthquake, well, remember at trial, she blamed her father, George, yeah. saying that Kelly, one crazy theory was Kelly drowned in the pool, which, you know, that statistically is not that crazy in an area with a lot of pools. But, but then her father fishes Kelly's body out, and then instead of calling 911, he says, hey, you know what, I'm just going to double back her and throw her in the woods. Mm. But then... Just about a year ago, I remember it because I was in an RV with the children on spring break last March. Um, she gave an AP interview, and they said, what really happened to Kelly? And she said, you know, I don't know, because last time I saw her, she was fine. That's not what they said at trial. How can you forget in, in that short space of time what happened? Yeah. Which, you know, if you didn't know already, she's just an outright liar. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, Lincoln that's... said, if you just tell the truth, there's nothing that you need to remember. And now you don't have to work on your story. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody can claim they've never lied before. But i got to tell you, every lie I've ever told blew up in my face. You will get caught somehow, yeah. someday. That's what I tell the children. Don't even bother. Just don't. Yeah, yeah don't waste your time. You know, mm -mm. Proof she was stress. Well, you know, that's got to be, that was one of the most frustrating cases, too, because you just, knew she was guilty and it just you know I, I just I still roll my eyes over that that's just crazy yeah I get into it with the top mom juror mm-hmm oh good <laughs> the fur will fly <laughs> oh that's, that's good it needs to well Nancy. Yeah, I thought it was so much fun talking to you now listen to me I know it's 11 o'clock but I'm making the twins stay up and watch it and you have to too Okay. I, I, promise. I am really looking forward to it. And um, I, I love A&E. It's been a real blessing. It reminds me a little bit of my uh, books that I've written about Haley Dean are being turned, are there movies on Hallmark. And when I met the Hallmark people, I was so stunned because they were just so nice. And genuine and real. Not at all like TV people that I'm used to. Mm -hmm. And, um, same thing has happened at A&E. They are, it's, everybody works so hard to get these witnesses, to get these facts, to dig deeper and, and produce evidence that was not admitted at trial. And it is astounding. For instance, with Top Mom, we find a woman that did jail time with her when she was waiting for trial, and you're going to fall over when you hear what this inmate says Taught how Top Mom acted, what she said, and how she behaved behind bars regarding Kelly. And oh, I mean, man. I really think that this evidence would have resulted in a different verdict had it been brought to trial. I really do. Um, yeah. Serious question, because you can't just drop me off at the corner like that, Nancy. It, oh, I like that. I'm stealing that, and I'm claiming it's mine. <laughs> when, when it, <laughs> I'm going to look for it now. But but if evidence like this comes out again, I mean, can't you try? Is there a way to retry the case with new evidence, or is that still double jeopardy? You know what? Don't make my chest hurt. It's still double jeopardy. There's nothing we can do about it. Oh wow! Come on. Actually, it's now my teeth are hurting just saying it. <laughs> I mean, but there's more than one way to skin a cat. For instance, in Robert Blake, there was a civil action. Same thing with Simpson. But in that case. It would be her parents, Kelly's grandparents, and they're not going to file against their own daughter. Plus, she doesn't have two pennies rubbed together anyway. You know she's not working. Yeah. You know, every day I work. I work multiple jobs. Top mom, mm -mm. she just kicks back, has a couple of photos taken. I don't know if she gets paid for them or not. They're always at a bar. Uh, but anyway, that's her decision. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, Nancy, this has been great. We have to have you again and then talk I think you guys are kicking me out. I just said some goodbye. Well, no, no. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, this is what I want. If there's any way in your schedule, after you see the show, our program, 11 o'clock, A&E, Thursday, March 29th, I want to hear what you have to say. I would like to fight with you about it. Okay. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Please yeah. invite me back. I will. This is great. <laughs> We'd love to. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys at Crime Con. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye, Bye buddy. <laughs> You're listening to the House of Mystery. And now, back to the show. You are back in the House of Mystery, and I'm your host, Al Warren, broadcasting from KCAA Los Angeles. And this is Kevin Thompson coming to you out of WXEI, the talk of Clearview, Florida. And we've got Stephen David Lampley, who are, is our true crime commentary, of course. Uh, hey, Stephen. Hey there. Welcome. Glad to be here. Okay, now we're going to jump right into it. We've got a guest waiting, and he's uh, kind of in transit, and he's agreed to talk to us a little bit about his new show. Uh, welcome, Dan Abrams. Thank you. It's great to be with you guys. So, Dan, now you, you've certainly made your, um, I don't want to say comeback, but uh, with Live PD, and uh, now you've got the new show with Nancy Grace. Um, wow, uh, you're a busy man. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, it's been busy in addition, of course, you know, uh, still doing my ABC News uh, daily uh, daily work, I'm doing the legal uh, correspondent work for ABC News. So it's, uh, it's been a busy time. And, uh, and you know, I know you guys love, uh, love true crime, and I've sort of recreated uh, Court TV on the, so far it's been on the Internet. We're about to get big distribution with a long crime network. So a lot of things going on. Very exciting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, um, well, let's let's get to the new show first. Um, how did you? How did it come about? Where did it come from? The idea, you and Nancy Grace, and uh, some of the big cases. So, so Nancy and I were doing regular segments on Good Morning America, and we, we weren't there to debate, but we ended up debating, um, and it became a um, uh, a well received and um, popular segment. Nancy and I would debate these legal topics, and we kept hearing, "Oh, you guys should do a show. You guys should do a show." And I think we were, you know, at first we we're just like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." We're both doing a lot of other things, and then we just started getting serious about it and uh, move forward. And now, uh, now the new the new show airs Thursday at eleven on A and E. Now, how, how did you oh, guys go about finding the cases? Which cases, you know, what went into that? I mean, I'm sure Casey Anthony is one of them. Drew Peterson is one of the cases. But do you guys each get to pick one, or are they picked for you, and you begin to research? How does that work? So, so you know, these are all cases Nancy and I have both covered. Um, but I'll say this, which is, a and E wanted us to do a few topics at the beginning, uh, like Casey Anthony and Drew Peterson, as you mentioned. Um, but after that point, uh, it's kind of up to us where we go from there. And you know, what's interesting about Nancy and me is part of what we're looking for is stories where we can learn something, dig deeper, uh, potentially stories where we don't necessarily agree um, on everything. And look, and and the interesting thing is, um, you know, we've already shot four shows. And, you know, while Nancy and I may agree in many of these cases on the outcome, for example, Casey Anthony, we both agree that she should have been found uh, guilty in our minds. But she, she, she doesn't understand the verdict, which was not guilty, of course. And I'm much more understanding of, of why the jury came to the verdict that it did. Similarly, in the, in the Robert Blake case, uh, you guys will, of course, remember that one. Um, yes. mm -hmm. And uh, so, so we, what we're able to do now, and, and I think that, that you guys in particular will appreciate this, is that when you get a little time away from a story, and it's no longer the top news story, and not everyone's making the calls, and people are kind of forgetting some of the details, it allows you to take a look back, talk to some people who didn't want to talk before, um, it allows you to dig into the story in a way that you can't do when everything is coming down on that story. 
It allows you a little more time to be thoughtful about it, uh, to talk to people who didn't want to speak before. And that's been the amazing thing to me, is this hasn't just been about looking back at old cases. It's about trying to move forward on these old cases. And that's been the most exciting part for me. Do, do you actually think that, um, how is this? Has it changed your mind on some of these cases as you've been going through them? So I don't want to say, I don't, I don't think it's changed my mind, uh, but I will tell you that, you know, that there have been things that I have learned in researching again and in talking to some of our guests that have made me shift a bit in my position. For example, hmm. one of the stories you did was the Sean B. case. Um, and the guy who was tried and convicted, this guy Guandique, uh, who was tried and convicted for her murder, his, his conviction was overturned, and they decided not to retry him. Now, my position going into this had been, boy, this was a flimsy case against Guandique. Um, this is probably a case, you know, their key witness ended up being proven to be a liar on a key point, which is why they're not retrying it. But in the context of studying and talking to people about the case, I became um, more convinced that you know, there's a real chance that Guandique was responsible for this, even if he's not being tried, even if he's not officially convicted in the, in the court of law. Um, and so that was interesting to me. Is, and, and that's an area, again, Nancy was, was, was very hard on Guandique, and I think that some of the points she made about the testimony um, that had come in in his trial, which wasn't that closely covered, et cetera, was pretty compelling. Um, so, so that's the sort of example I'm talking about. Now, how, did the, how do you feel that the families of the victims feel about these cases being reexamined? Are they excited, or do they kind of want it left alone? It's a really good question, and, and I think that, you know, it depends on the case, right, which is do, do I think that um, in the uh, Casey Anthony case that they want um, – uh, to talk about it, the family of Casey Anthony? Uh, no, I, I don't think that they're that eager, although I understand that, that they are looking to do something, um, you know, but, um, you know, I, I don't know that, that that's super exciting to them. On the other hand, in the Drew Peterson case, the fact that Stacy is still, um, quote, unquote, missing, um, his fourth wife, and he was convicted, of course, in the murder of his third wife, I think her family does want this to stay in the news. I think that she, they, she, they do want people to talk about it. I think in the Chandra Levy case, because it remains unsolved, they do want people talking about it. Um, they do want people investigating. So it really depends on the story as to whether people, you know, want to uh, keep talking about this or if they, you know, want it to go away. Wow. Uh, now, do you see this becoming a very long series? Are you guys planning on doing several seasons now? Well, look, that'll be a decision for A&E. Um, you know, we, we signed a, a six-series um, deal. Uh, sorry, a six-episode deal. Um, and so that's all that's sort of guaranteed with this. Um, but, um, you know, uh, we'll see. Uh, um, don't know. Don't know beyond that. Wow. And, and um, so, yeah, now, are you going to keep on doing the live PD as well? Well, yeah, live PD is the number one live way to show on cable. Uh, so <laughs> li live PD is going to remain, uh, <laughs> gonna remain a, a, big, a big focus for me. That's not going anywhere. Um, hey, and, I, uh, can, and that's obvious. Yeah. I was just going to say, can I ask you, what, what made you go into doing live PD? Like, was there something about this show that was different from all the other cop well, shows? things? Well, it, obviously, the, the, the biggest difference is that it's uh, a live, accurate portrayal of what police officers do every day. That's very different than a show like, let's say, Cops, where they take sort of highlights and take the moments in the, you know, the, the sort of the, the greatest hits, so to speak. Um, what we're showing sometimes isn't super exciting, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're sometimes we're showing a traffic stop. Um, and what an officer's thinking at the traffic stop is being made. And look, and there's a lot of uncertainty in every traffic stop, every domestic call that these officers get. And so it takes you on a ride along. And I think that's more sort of documentary style programming. You know, because remember, live PD is three hours every Friday and Saturday night. So, so it really is, you know, like, like, a, like a documentary 
in that sense, but it's live following police departments. I think that's a very different show than anything else that's been done. And that's why it's so popular. Now, Dan, yeah. I've, I've got to ask this, Dan. I've always wanted to ask somebody behind the scenes. You know, as a member of law enforcement, and, and Steve, a retired member of law enforcement, um, how much reality is it really? Because I, I, I would, be, I would tend to, yes, I would tend to be a little bit nervous with the cameras following me. So I'm, up, you know, I'm apt to be on my very, very best behavior. Whereas sometimes police work gets a little dirty, gets a little gritty. I mean, look, I think if the answer is that police are on their best behavior, that's not a bad thing. No. Um, the no. bottom line is the, 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 body, the, 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 the bottom line is their body cam now increasingly being worn by police officers around the country. Having a camera is nothing new. Um, it, it, in fact, it's becoming an increasing reality of policing. Now, you can certainly argue that that's different than a live uh, camera, which is uh, going out to the world. Um, keep in mind that, you know, no officers are forced uh, to be on with us, meaning we have to do this with the permission of the departments. The departments then decide, you know, who they want us to follow around, and that in part is a decision by the department and in part by the officers themselves. I mean, we've had, you know, officers who we've followed, um, um, who are really, really excited about it, and others who say, you know what, it was uh, extra work. Um, and as a result, um, they didn't want to, um, um, you know, they, they were less enthusiastic. It's most, I have to say, though, it's almost all the officers we follow um, like it, um, and the, certainly the departments like it, I think, because it shows um, what police officers deal with on a regular basis. And it's, it's a lot more of the mundane stuff that they deal with. You know, I mean, look, we've seen, uh, you know, excuse the, the, uh, the example, we've seen a number of suspects urinate in, in police cars. And you know who has to clean it up? The police officers. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of an example. And, I, you know, I, I don't say it to, to be prurient. I say it to show you that there's, a, there's another side to policing that people don't see. There's the nervousness going into even a, a domestic call, the uncertainty. Um, you know, all we see in the news are that last moment when there's a, a police-involved shooting. Typically, is the stuff when we see it. And there's a, you know, as you you guys know, as former law enforcement, you know, that, that that's not that's not 99.8 percent of the job. Well, that's true. You know, uh, Dan, I, I, of course, I've had a book, and I won't go there. But I've had a, a ton of comments from people who say, I like what you said in the book because it's not about just catching the bad guy. You let us see what's really going on, and you tell us the true story. And, and you're so right about uh, live PD. That's exactly, that's exactly why it's so popular, in my opinion. You know, uh, I, I was just going to say that. And now, now, Dan, do you think having cameras – affects the way the justice system works. And that means both in um, court and uh, watching, you know, like O.J. Simpson and all that live, just as yeah. well as on live PD. Now, because I still can't wrap my head around knowing that uh, I have that many people watching me and then with social media and talking about me. I mean, um, doesn't it affect the way you do your job as a cop or as a prosecutor or defense attorney? So let's separate it into courts and the cops, because I think they're two different issues. Why? Because in courts, courtrooms were built with galleries. Galleries are there. People can watch. So the public can see their room at work. Um, you know, I, I, I know that there are going to be some uh, defense attorneys and prosecutors who are going to say, I don't like it. Um, and, you know, my response to them in most cases is, I'm sorry, that's just too bad. Um, you know, the reality is that, that when you are representing the people of the state of Florida or the people of the state of New York, the people of that state have a right to know how you're doing what you're doing and be able to see it. Um, now, that doesn't mean in every case that there, oh, you know, if there's a case involving, uh, you know, uh, some, something very sensitive with regard to children, uh, uh, child testimony. I'm not suggesting that we should always have cameras, et cetera, in courtrooms, but I think, in my view, the presumption should be that the public is allowed to see what happens in courtrooms. Now, that is different 
than with regard to policing, right? Because there aren't calories built uh, to watch policing. Um, but I think that I think the way we do it on live PD um, is done in a non-intrusive um, and I think you know important way. And so. So do I think it is important to the justice system? Look, I think it is important for people to understand what police officers do every day. I think it's just, it, and that goes well beyond what is in the manual, right? Well, did they violate the, the rules of uh, engagement here? You know, okay, that's, that's an important question, but that's not the question that officers deal with every day. The questions that officers deal with every day are the ones that we see, which is, what is proper protocol when you're pulling over a vehicle? What can you do for your own protection? What happens when you get a domestic call? How do officers go about deciding when two parties are both pointing the finger at the other one? Um, you know, just the day-to-day -day thing that officers deal with is what you see on live PD. And, you know, I think that that doesn't mean that every police department in, uh, in America is going to want to be on the show. But I do think that I will tell you that the departments that are with us um, almost uniformly, certainly when you talk to the police chiefs, they will tell you that it's been good for their departments. Um, do, do, do some cities get political and say, oh, you know, showing crime in our city isn't good for tourism? Oh, okay, maybe. But, you know, I'm not as concerned with uh, the tourism um, as the mayor or the city council may be. I am more concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned that the police chief, who's uh, uh, team we're following thinks that we're doing a uh, respectful and professional job in the way we're doing what we're doing. Wow. Well, Dan Abrams, I know you're uh, in a pinch and very busy, but uh, we thank you for being here. And again, the show is uh, Grace versus Abrams and on A&E and uh, check your local area and listings for times uh, should be a great show. And uh, how come your name wasn't first? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's funny. When they, <laughs> when they, when they created the, the, the show, you know, I, at first I, I was like, oh, you know, do I care? And, I, I, and then the answer was, you know what, I don't really care. Maybe I should have cared, uh, but I don't. Um, and I think Nancy's great. And uh, by the way, the show's on at 11 p.m. Uh, on a &E. so, uh So, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope all your, um, your listeners are... Uh, Give, give us a shot on, um, on Thursday. I'm sure they will. And uh, it'd be great to have you back again sometime when you've got more time talking about policing and things like that. And, uh, uh, again, Dan Abrams, thank you very much. Sure. I'd love to come back and talk also about the Law and Crime Network because that relates to the cameras in the courtroom we were talking about. Oh. Um, so I'm happy to come back. And, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to that and uh, uh, very much enjoy your show. So thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Dan, thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.